Hello, everyone, and welcome. It is now the top of the hour, so we are going to begin. Uh, my name is Robin. I'll be our host today. You're just going to hear from me a little bit at the beginning and then a little bit at the end. Um, but I want to thank everyone. Thank you for chiming in over the chats and letting us know where you're joining from. Really appreciate that. I'm going to open up some polls real quick. So here in just a moment, you're going to see a few questions pop up on your screen. And if you don't mind, take just a moment, uh, fill this out. It gives us a good idea of who we have in attendance today. Uh, we've got a fairly large group that should be joining us. And it's just nice to see where everyone's dialed in from today. So the first question, who are you affiliated with? Industry, federal government, or state or local government? And the vast majority of us, the vast majority of us are with industry. That's fantastic. You're in the right place. For those of us that have joined from uh, outside of industry, from a government agency, uh, you're welcome. Thank you for joining. Really appreciate that. I think hopefully you'll get some good information today. Second question, do you currently have any active GSA contracts? Not a prerequisite by any means, just good to know. Helps us kind of shape uh, the discussion. Yes, we have contracts. No, we haven't. Uh, we have in the past, but not currently, or no, we've never had any. Looks like the majority of us have, and that's good. Um, for those of you that don't, you're going to get some great information today. Don't worry. How much experience do you have in the federal marketplace? Zero. I don't know what any of this means. Rookies. We're just getting started. A few years, we're getting the hang of it, or pros. We've been doing this a long time, and it looks like we're pretty well divided, uh, but we've got a lot of people uh, that have a decent amount of experience on the line, and that's fantastic. Um uh, Good, good, good. Glad to hear that. And for those of you that are new to this, rookies, or you don't know what any of this means, uh, you're in good hands, don't worry. We're going to try to explain a lot of things along the way. And feel free to use the Q&A function if you do have questions. And then last question we're asking here, business size, uh, small or other than small. Uh, it doesn't matter either way. We just like to know. It looks like most of us are small business, which is what I would expect. Okay. And I can see that most of us have had an opportunity to answer those questions. So I think I'm going to go ahead and end it. That gives us a really good idea of who we have. So thank you. I'm going to end this. Fantastic. Let me close that out of the way. Uh, again, thank you so much for making time out of your busy schedules to be here uh, for MAS office hours. I'm going to go over a few housekeeping things and then I'm going to turn it over to our speakers and our experts for the day. Uh, number one, along the bottom of your screen, you should see a few options. Um, the chat function, which most of us are using, uh, and I can see you guys are saying hi to one another there. Uh, that is fantastic. If you do have questions, you should see a Q&A pod down there. Uh, we just ask, do your best to try to ask those questions in the Q&A pod. That gives you the um, the best chance of getting your question addressed. If you put it in the chat, pod, we might not see it, we might skip over it at the end. So uh, if you do have questions, use that Q&A pod down there. But we're all pros. Everybody is a Zoom pro nowadays. So I think we all know how that works. All right, enough from me. At this point, I'm going to turn it over to our expert and our speaker for the day, Miss Stephanie Shutt. Great. Thank you, Robin. And thank you, everyone, for coming today. Um, I'm just going to reiterate some of the things Robin stated. Uh, if you guys have technical difficulties, you guys can choose to use the chat, but if you have questions, so just so we can record them, we do have some great experts on the line with us to start answering some of those questions. So just make sure you get them in that Q&A pod. Um, some of them will answer along the way. And then at the end of this quick presentation, uh, we will go into some more um, detailed ones and we will have Jen from the Mass PMO. Um, she will be reading out the questions for me today. So that's going to be great. Um, also, just to say a little really quick, um, Jen is the individual that was responsible for the request for information related to the Vendor Support Center. And today that's going to be our main topic is that Vendor Support Center. So we're going to touch on a little bit of that survey, just a tiny bit, just so you guys know. And then we're going to actually dive into the website and kind of look around just so I can show you what's there. And then we'll open it up to questions. Your questions don't just need to be about the Vendor Support Center. If you have a question in general, um, you're more than welcome to ask it on this call. We will try and get to everyone. 
Um, just as a precursor, I do know that there are different feelings out there. If you are from the press or you have a question related to media or press or anything related to GSA as a whole, not specific to the multiple award schedule program, um, I will invite you to go to press at gsa.gov. That is the email address for press. Please do not ask those questions on this one. We would like to focus in on the um, issues and questions that people have about the mass program. Um, but with that, thank you all for coming and we're going to get this all kicked off. So let's start sharing my screen. Um, let's see here. This is it. Okay. So let's get this into present mode. So we put out a request for information and we did it through a Qualtrics survey. We found with Qualtrics surveys, um, the one thing that's easier for us and for you guys is that it is much easier to um, answer more quickly. We can get you guys just this or this or this or this question. It gets our data nice and clean. We usually try and make them so they're not more than five to 10 minutes. We like them to be super short when we're asking for information because we know that, especially for small business, but even for large businesses, you guys just don't have the manpower to have someone who goes through this. So. One of the things we're looking at is updating the Vendor Support Center. We're gonna be updating it this year and probably into next year as well. But we're hoping to keep it a little bit cleaner than we have in the past also. So how we kick this off is we put out a interact post and then a request for information. That request for information was um, basically that last bit of November right before Thanksgiving. We did want to get it done before Thanksgiving because we wanted no one to be worried about answering questions on a survey over a holiday weekend. Um, we had 71 industry responses and we also put it out to our workforce and we did get 37 um, workforce responses as well. And that's really great. It's not a huge population, but it was right around the number that we were kind of hoping for because really we wanted to just kind of get a touch related to the vendor support center. What we found out is what most people use the vendor support center is for the help desk. Um, finding the help desk, doing the help desk, all that kind of stuff. So the first thing we learned is one of the most important things about that website is the help desk and making sure you guys can find that help desk quickly and you guys can get the, to that um, help desk as quickly as possible. Um, what you did not like about the help desk, uh, I mean about the VSC was also the help desk. <laughs> so we did have some issues with that, the lack of plain language and it's hard to navigate. Um, yes, and I will uh, go through some things that I'm seeing on there as well of things, especially related to that hard to being to navigating. So basically that big complaint is that user journey. And I'm gonna say right now, we 100% agree with what everyone stated with this. Um, what we also heard is that you wanted the VSC to be more user-friendly, um, increase help desk support, um, include a search feature. So this is one of the features we've been trying to get for a while. We are hoping to get it this year um, is a search feature so that you guys can search the website more quickly and get the answers that you need utilize plain language, um, have current training, update and repl or replace SIP. So uh, SIP has been a main uh, heartache uh, to say it lightly for industry for years. I will let you know that on the workforce side, uh, the portal that they go through to look at SIP is called CORES. It is equally as not user-friendly as the SIP side is. So our workforce and you guys are definitely in line of we need to figure out a better way to do this in SIP. So we do have a project happening right now. It's been doing the discovery phase for the last year or so called the catalog management project. And they are hoping to find a better thing for SIP. So that's something that um, you're gonna see over the next year or so, you're gonna start seeing more and more communication about that and what we're gonna be doing. So really quick to kind of go into this website. The Vendor Support Center was created, um, just for everyone's background, as a website that um, industry should use as a, like a single point entry. What has happened through the years is this website has somewhat become the dumping ground of various amounts of information with kind of the viewpoint of, um, if you guys can find it, great. Um, we've been trying to be more proactive in the mass program over the past couple of years 
with our communication and cleaning things up. And now that we have things like the mass roadmap for new offers and the schedule page for um, existing offers who existing contractors who need to do modifications on gsa.gov in a single place um, we need to rethink what we're putting on the vendor support center it doesn't need to have everything um, there verbatim but maybe it needs to be a single point of entry where you guys can get information um, when you go on here basically the vendor support center one of the things that frustrates me is the font is too small it is very hard to read um, that is something that we're going to be looking at fixing, but majority of it is broken out into boxes and there is a plethora of information in this website. Um, we do have the up part, which is the updates. This is what's happening right now. It's things that we're trying to keep um, as clean as possible. It is items that are going to be those top concerns for you guys. Um, that kind of information. So we've been definitely trying to put that up there. Um, we do have some stuff that is in these boxes down here, whether that be information on the transactional data reporting and that pilot for a lot of people who've been participating in that. Um, one of the big ones is can't find who you're looking for. This section is your help desk. So that's a big thing for everyone, especially from that survey that we're seeing. Um, the vendor toolbox. This is for your the vendor education center, but this is also so you guys can go through um, to determine if schedules is a right fit for you. If you're a prospective offerer and you are thinking about getting on the schedules program, um, I always state that you should use caution. The federal marketplace is not for everyone. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. And before you enter the federal market, you really should understand it. I recommend that any company really try and work in that federal marketplace for at least a year, if not two to five years, prior to entering the schedules program. Um, there are a lot of requirements in the schedules program. We have a very large contracts, a lot of compliance. It takes a lot of resources and um, money for industry partners to keep these contracts up. So just making sure that you have that, there are various requirements as well of related to compliance that is ongoing checks of compliance, but also that you guys are making sales in there. So just making sure that you understand the true breadth of the contract is something that's very, very important. One of the largest things we have on here is getting on advantage. It is probably um, one of the most used tools. Um, just so you guys know, you have all of these different things in here, but one of the things I did want to show you is this vendor startup kit um, if you go in here, it will go through some of the things that you need to do before you actually get in SIP. I would recommend not diving right into SIP. I would definitely go here first and just make sure that you're ready to go before you actually download that program and everything in there. Um, so you have all of this information that's going through and you definitely have to read through quite a bit of information. Uh, and the instructions, but there is, you have the software that can be downloaded, but there is also in here, um, the SIP instructions. And this is a user manual. It, it goes through step-by-step step how to use SIP, what you should be doing with it, um, what you should be doing if you have services versus what you should be doing if you have products and what that whole realm is. So just making sure that you guys know that that's there. It is buried very deep. These are some of the things that we're going to probably try and work at trying to make them a little bit higher level, a quicker hit, just so that everyone can find things a little easier as we update this website. Um, another thing you're going to see in here, um, and the SIP instructions actually are on the top as well, but most people miss that. We have, um, I want a contract. This is a great place to start related to um, the readiness assessment the Vendor Education Center, um, and a little bit about federal procurement, the types of contracts, the schedules programs, but also other GSA contract vehicles. Making sure you find your right fit is very important to us. Um, as I said, it is time. Um, it's a lot of time, it's a lot of effort, it's a lot of resources to get and maintain a schedule contract. 
Um, to get on contract typically takes anywhere, depending on how complex your offer is, it can take anywhere from three months to a year. So if you have a highly complex offer where you're offering um, things that are in cybersecurity or anything in that realm, um, it's going to take much longer to get on contract. So if you're looking for a contract vehicle that is a quick get on, you're just registering, that's not this vehicle. This is a very comprehensive contract vehicle. Please make sure you read everything before you do it. Um, we do have some tools in here related to marketing, um, getting on GSA Advantage, but also exposure and bidding is very popular. But um, we also have this market research tool that you guys can go through as well. And some of these are gonna be really great for you if you have services, and there's others that are gonna be really good for you if you have products. And then the last thing we have in here, the last two things, we have education right here. This has got a bit of different things that you guys can go to. Um, in here, it's a lot of training, but the mass quarterly newsletters that we put out is also stored here. This is a really great hit to kind of figure out where we've gone in the last quarter and where we're going in the next quarter. So this is always something I would recommend that you review. If you are the admin rep on your contract, this is also probably being emailed to you as well. And then finally, one of the largest tabs we have is for um, administration. So this is talking about modifications and this is also gonna link you back to gsa.gov where all those templates are related on how you modify the SOP or guidance related to doing modifications and all of that information. We're gonna have a bunch of information related to your reporting requirements, when you report, how you report, what you report, also um, how much industrial funding fee you need to pay and all of that kind of information. Um, we have a bit of your contract management. And one of the things we are looking at, so these are the compliance factors we have but when it comes to compliance, you have two sides. You have the compliance of your contract, but you also have how um, our IOA groups or inter um, industrial operations um, analysts come in and they review your compliance. So here are your compliance factors. Down here is the reference guide of how the IOA is going to evaluate this compliance. So you have both of those packages so that you guys can do it. Again, as you see, there are a lot of things in here related to compliance and making sure your contract's up to date. So just make sure that you're aware of all of those things prior to going through the effort of getting on contract or modifying your contract to make it larger. Um, so with that, I'm going to actually stop sharing my screen and we're gonna start kicking off the questions. It looks like we will have about 40 minutes for questions. So if you do have a question, make sure you're putting it in that Q&A pod. Please don't put it in the chat. Please put it in the Q&A pod so we can start tracking that. Um, and we're gonna just go until we run out of time or we run out of questions. Um, and that's how we're gonna be doing this. So I'm gonna stop sharing. Um, I'm gonna have Jen from the Mass PMO um, share her video while she goes through these Q&As. All right, hi everyone. And once again, just if you have questions, please put it in the Q&A box below. So the first question we have, does every schedule holder have to now get a CMMC certification? So that is an excellent question. No, <laughs> the easy answer is no. The more complex answer is maybe. Um, for our schedules, we do not require you to get the CMMC certification. Um, that being said, this is something um, from the 889 and from everything else related to supply chain. And for those of you guys who don't know um, what CMMC is, and I cannot for the life of me remember what the acronym stands for at this time, but basically what it is, is it's DOD supply chain risk management procedures. And 889 part B, which is the uh, supply chain uh, item in our contracts that just went through, which basically states that contractors do not use prohibited sources in their supply chain. Oh, perfect. Someone just put cybersecurity maturity model. Thank you so much, Shelly. Thank you. 
Um, but basically what it is, is it is 889 part B, uh, a bit on steroids. So you've got the supply chain and everything in there. So for our contracts, because we deal with a lot of civilian agencies who do not need CMMC, we don't require it in our contractors. That being said, if you are a company that typically works um, with DOD, it may be a good idea to get that ready to go because chances are they will add that to the task order level. But it is more of a DOD thing. I can't say whether or not we will adopt it in the future at this time, um, but right now, no, it's not required. So next question, will the new VPP be mandatory? So at this time, um, the VPP um, is a new vendor portal that we are putting out, um, just so everyone knows what it is. It is basically something in which um, the manufacturer of an item can go in there and identify who their distributors are, who are their authorized resellers, and that kind of stuff. It is something that we are using to... Um, offset and build on that letter of supply. So you guys have the letter of supplies if you guys do provide products. And what that letter of supply is saying is that you have authorization from the manufacturer or an authorized distributor wholesaler that you have an undisturbed process or source of materials that you can provide it to the government um, as long as it's under that maximum order threshold that you've put in your contract so that people can buy it from you. The VPP is something that manufacturers can go into and they can certify who that is. Um, right now, it is not mandatory. I don't know how that's gonna change in the future. Right now, this is basically just to kind of test the waters. This is something that um, as a workforce, this will help our workforce a lot. This helps our supply chain risk management, but it is also something that we have had a lot of people in industry really requests that we provide because we do have a lot of people in industry that they are the manufacturer of an item and then they go look on GSA Advantage and they see all these people selling their stuff and they come back to us and say, no, we never said that they could. This is one of those ways that we're hoping to solve those kind of problems. So um, right now it's not mandatory, but just know that as things get more electronic in GSA and get uh, better, there will be some benefits to this related to resellers and dealers and distributors uh, because it will be able to make sure that your data looks good and is happy for those catalogs as well. Can you discuss setting up a price proposal which requires a mod for price increases versus a pricing structure with built-in annual increases over the life of the award? So this is related to your economic price adjustment clauses in your contract. Typically, um, companies that provide services are more likely to do an automatic increase. This is basically they're stating at the beginning when they're getting their contract on, or if you do a mod to add this later, um, this is something that you guys can do. It works more with services just because there's inflation. So if there's inflation in the world, chances are every year your pricing goes up a certain percentage. And as long as you can document that your pricing does go up and you have a really nice happy history of that, this should be a pretty easy thing to demonstrate and therefore be a pretty easy thing to do. It makes it easier for you guys as um, service contractors, especially for contractors who do very large service BPAs because then that pricing can transfer to the BPAs and you already have a five year out pricing situation going. So it's something that we definitely do recommend for services. However, if you don't have pricing that goes up every year, you can definitely do modifications on demand. And that's typically what happens for um, products. Products, because the market is a little bit more volatile, it is based on manufacturers, it is based on raw materials. Um, for example, years ago, we had a crisis with um, steel and um, the pricing just skyrocketed and we had to adjust those pricings very quickly um, and they changed very all over the place for about a year. 
So with products, we typically don't recommend that you do an automatic annual EPA or economic price adjustment. We usually say do it on demand because we really want you to review your pricing and actually understand what you need and when you need it. So, um, and I do know also with products for some contractors, if you are a distributor or reseller, you usually have a warehouse where you have all your stuff. So the pricing is good for a bit. And then when it goes, you really have to do that jump up so that you can then do it for the next year or two of products that you have in that warehouse. So um, definitely that's kind of where that difference is gonna fall in. How do you find interested vendors for e-buy solicitation? This is a feature at beta.sam.gov. So um, this is going to depend from what perspective that uh, this is coming from. So if this is coming from an agency perspective, there are a couple of things we do related to getting an interested vendor list. The first thing we do is we do um, what's called a Qualtrics survey um, RFI, and we do it through what's called MRAS. And basically market research as a service is basically what that stands for. And that just means that we put out a survey and we can tailor it to any group of industry that we have. Um, so we do have that side as well. Um, I do see that Paula has just clarified, it is from the vendor side. Um, from the vendor side, if you are an interested vendor, um, really look out for those MRAS RFIs. They will be very important. It is how we determine whether people are interested in things and it helps especially with um, potential down selects that could happen in the future. Um, if you are interested, um, if you're looking for interested vendors um, for sub K um, or CTA situations, looking to team with and all of that kind of stuff, um, eBuy doesn't really have a function for you as a contractor to determine industry in, interested vendors. But one of the things you can do is you can go to eLibrary. If you go to eLibrary and you click on the special item number of the services or products that you need, um, at the very top of that special item number, there will be a red link and it will say download um, this group of contractors. You can download that group of contractors and you could email them yourselves to see if any of them are interested in being a CTA partner and put that out. And that way you can just copy and paste those email addresses really quick to put in there and get that interested vendor list. So next question. I understand that you must demonstrate $25,000 a year in sales for the previous two years in order to submit an e-offer. I had a GSA contract under my old company with ample sales. I've now formed a new company. Can I use sales from my old company in satisfying this requirement? So the $25,000 a year in sales is um, actually for when you're on contract. Um, it's not doing with your past. What's dealing with your past that you're going to have to do for your new company is the financial assessment to show that your company is financially secure in fulfilling that two years of financial documentation. So that's where you're gonna see that. It's gonna be more on that. The 25,000 is more post-award, after you're awarded, you need to make $25,000 of reportable sales in their first two years and $25,000 worth of reportable sales each year thereafter for your contract. Um, but when you're doing the offer process, we're more looking for your past performance and we're looking to see if you're financially secure and you have two years of financial documentation that at your preponderance of work NAICS or the NAICS code in which you feel you will be doing the most work, we can see that you are at average or above average of that ratio of financial stability that um, um, the Department of Commerce, IRS and SBA kind of put together. We are registered in SAM. How do we register for GSA and where to start to check for opportunities? So if you're just checking for opportunities, one of the good places to check for, uh, if you're seeing if GSA is going to be putting anything out, if you go to the acquisition gateway, and if you just Google acquisition gateway, it will come up. Um, there is a small business, um, our office of small business utilization, 
does put out a forecasting tool for GSA. So that would be one place where you could look for GSA on there. Um, if you're looking to go under one of the GSA contracts, there isn't anything that is um, as easy as a registration. In reality, what you need to do is actually apply for one of the contracts. In the MASS program, our contracts are always open to new offers. You can put in an offer at any time and you're gonna to go to gsa.gov backslash MASS roadmap um, to get that information. And uh, that's gonna be the place where you're gonna follow all of those instructions on how to put an offer together. So that's how you'll do that. For things that are other contract vehicles, they have an open season. So you're gonna to have to kind of look through their stuff on that open season and look at their interact pages, whether it be the GWAX program um, or the OASIS program. I believe the GWAX, the Alliance Small Business Replacement Contract Polaris is supposed to be coming out sometime. I don't know the dates for that, uh, but those ones are more of a open season. They're not open all the time. Mass is pretty unique where we can onboard a contractor at any time, but you do need to go through the full offer um, procedures. There really isn't an easy click here to register situation. I am being told that I must now submit a complete price proposal template when adding a packaged officer supplier to a contractor's packaged office SIN. The purpose stated for this is to make a price reasonable, reasonableness determination. However, the prices have already been determined fair and reasonable. Should so, I read that again? Yeah, I think, yeah, I, I, I've got it. <laughs> okay. So um, we review price um, reasonableness and fair and reasonableness by regulation and by law every time you add anything. It doesn't matter if it's on another contract. It doesn't matter if you've had it in the past. If you don't have it on that contract and you are doing a modification to add it, that CO will review your fair and reasonable of pricing. Pricing changes on a daily basis. So what may be a market um, fair and reasonable a month ago may not be true today. So um, that is the rules our COs do have to follow, and that is correct. You will need to do a price proposal template, um, and I would definitely follow everything that your CO is asking for because they are asking for it for a reason. They are not just trying to make you do work for no reason. That is a requirement in which they actually have to review. Since it's already come up, are VPP and the catalog management project, you mentioned the same thing? And as a follow-up, will VPP ultimately replace SIN? So catalog is the overarching project. VPP is one of the silos within that project. So um, the verified products portal is really just a supply chain portal related to manufacturers and manufacturer data. The catalog as a whole is what would be to replace SIP, not VPP, um, because Sometimes we have manufacturers who are selling their own items, but sometimes we do not. Majority of the times we have dealers and resellers and distributors that are on contract. Um, a lot of times the manufacturers don't want to get into that. So, because it is a lot of work and they <laughs> delegate that down to those, to their distributors and dealers and resellers. Um, but for right now, no, the VPP will not be replacing SIP, but the catalog team is working on creating something that would replace SIP. Is there any way to make mass a best in class contract vehicle? So that is something that we are looking into. So for mass, we are a spend under management tier two contract. Um, one of the things that we do, we are looking at doing um, a lot of updates to different things to make, to get us to that tier three, which would put us in that best in class bracket. One of the issues we have in there is we don't have the transactional data across the program. That's our hiccup. So until we're able, um, and we do have the TDR, which is transactional data reporting pilot. We do have the next evaluation that will be happening in January. 
Um, if that evaluation does go well, we are hoping to open up the program, but we do have to get a certain percentage of the sales volume to go through TDR for us to even complete the process to get on the best in class um, vehicle side. So we have typically just done best in class in certain special item number categories and different things like that. But it is something we are looking into consistently to see where that is where we can kind of trigger that situation. Once we are approved, once we are approved on the GSA mass, what are the first few steps we should take to get started? So once you're approved, you should be going to that welcome package. The welcome package is on gsa.gov. Um, you should get an email when you get on there that sends you to that welcome package. And there are a couple of things that you need to go through and review. Um, a, you want to reevaluate that all your point of contacts are still really good and ready to go. You wanna make sure that your catalog, whether it be products or a uh, price list that is for services that is in a uh, PDF or whatever that is, but your catalog is up on advantage for everyone to see. There are other marketing tools that we recommend highly that you do, whether you put a GSA logo on your website, whether you list your GSA contract on your website, but getting that information out marketing wise. Um, if you have not done so already, I would put together a whole marketing plan and I would start doing, um, I just like lost it. It is everyone in business does it for business development, they pipelines. I would start doing pipeline reviews for those customer agencies that you think are going to be the customer agencies that you need to go in there. I would recommend that if you don't already have someone that you start playing around in beta.sam.gov to play around in that FPDS data, see where that money is being spent, see what how that's gonna help your pipeline, anything like you would be doing in that. And then the last things I would be doing is um, making sure that you have gotten your MFA and everything ready for your sales reporting portal to report your sales. You do have to report zero. So even if you have no sales, you've got to report that zero. So if you're reporting monthly because you're on TDR, make sure you go into that very first next month right after you're awarded and get that zero in there. Or if you've made any sales, what that is. If you are on a traditional commercial sales practice negotiation, then you're going to be reporting quarterly and you're going to go in there at the end of the quarter. And um, the months you would report is January, July, um, missing one, January, May, July, and October is when you're gonna report on those. Your fees are due on those quarterlies as well. So I would make sure if you're not sure when you report that you at least get into that sales reporting portal and make sure you can see your contracts, everything's there, ready to go. Once you get your price list on Advantage, you'll be able to get into eBuy. You should start making sure that you're looking in there for activity. But those would be my first things that I would do. Marketing, sales reporting. That's the main things you need to do. <laughs> Next question. We are preparing a mass proposal for 54151 HACS. At what point do we initiate the oral eval and how? Is that picked up with GSA's initial review of the packet or do we somehow give advance notice so that the eval can be scheduled? So that is done through, so the Haxons all do require that um, eval. Um, it is organized by the Haxon group. They are the ones who will do that technical review. Um, they pretty much put you in line first come first serve. So right now I know we have quite a few people trying to get on the Haxon so that um, wait is quite a bit right now. But as soon as you get that modification in to add that SIN, you will be put in that line for them to schedule an oral evaluation with you. If we want to restructure our organization and make changes in how our organization's labor categories are labeled, will this require modification to our schedule? So if you are changing the labor cat name, the description, or any of the factors that are in the description. So if you go to GSA Advantage and look up your company or eLibrary and look up your company and you pull that catalog out, that PDF, terms and conditions price list, you pull it out and you look at it. If your labor cat names change, if your descriptions change, your education, whatever that may be, then yes. 
you're going to do a modification and it's going to be related to changing those descriptions. It's a description change. You're not going to have to do a bunch of other things. It's just mainly going to be that description change um, and reevaluating, making sure that scope is right. Um, if um, this is just an internal organization change and your labor cats and descriptions are not changing, but your personnel are changing because you don't actually list real people, you just list a description, um, no, you would not need to update it. So it's all gonna depend on what exactly you're changing. If one has an active contract, but the price card has expired, what is the process to follow? So if you have an active contract, but the price card has expired, I'm not sure what you mean by the price card. Um, I'm not sure if you mean your price list or if you mean something else. Um, if you have an active contract and you have a price list and it is no longer good, or you've not updated it in a really long time, um, over two years and your price list has fallen off advantage or anything like that, you will, if you've not changed anything, you'll need to submit a new price list. If you've changed anything, you will need to do an EMOD to update that price list and then put that in. If this is related to an active contract that has a price card and it is not under mass, it's under another vehicle, I would contact your contracting officer and get guidance. But even under mass, your number one call is always your contracting officer. They're the one approving it, not me. You should call them first every time. We are a young company with small contracts for experience, but we have a good backup parent company, resources for obtaining personnel needed for any job, et cetera. Still, we only have enough experience to qualify for four labor categories, plus four levels for each LCAT. Any special guidance? So if you have a really good parent company and if they're on contract, the way I would grow with this is I would definitely look into contract or teaming arrangements. This is a way for small businesses or parent and sub businesses to team up together to both provide an offering. It gets you the sales you need to maintain your contract, but also provides you the experience you need in different things. Another thing you can do is in the services contracts, typically you guys are awarded the order level material sin. What you can do is as you're introducing new labor categories, as long as it's less than a third of the task order, you could place it under that order level material. Therefore, giving you guys the experience you would need to put it on your schedule and get it on that price list. Another thing you could do is contact your contracting officer. If you have a prospective bid or you feel you're going to go into a different thing and you have a subcontractor that is going to be providing those services for you and you're going to be the prime, um, you can talk to them about if you add them as a sub, how you would add those labor categories to your contract as well. That's going to be dependent on the information that you can get from that subcontractor and how strong that relationship is. But definitely the first step I would say is contractor teaming arrangements and then using that order level material sin to introduce new um, services into your contract. I'm rewording this question, but hopefully this is what they meant to say. Um, aside from the consolidation going on, are there additional ways that GSA is streamlining the care and feeding of a schedule? This is an excellent question. Yes, we are constantly looking for ways to streamline the care and feeding of the schedule. So um, a lot of the things that we're doing right now is we are looking at process improvement we are working with our systems components to see if we can um, get a better um, onboarding tool than EOF or EMOD, getting those up to date, getting it easier so that contractors can get on faster and our COs can get rid of certain admin tasks so they can really focus in on those negotiations and not just checking if you have items. So we are using things like RPA, we're hoping to expand that. Um, and using more bots in that realm so that we can move a little bit faster on things. Another thing that we are looking in is um, the National Defense Authorization Act of 2019. Um, GSA was granted the authority for increased competition at the task order level um, where we would no longer need to actually negotiate the pricing of a labor hour service. 
And so that is something we are looking, we're just starting the discovery phase of that, what the gap's gonna be for that. It's commonly referred to as 876 if anyone wants to look it up, but we are looking into that because we are hoping that if we can implement that sometime next year, this will get us to a place where we can really start to streamline down that offer process, especially for services. For products, we're using that catalog management so that we can hopefully get to a point where we can streamline how we get products on contract. And our goal is to make sure our, our cycle times go down. We're really hoping that um, our integrity continues at the high level we've kept it at, but then get those cycle times down and uh, get everyone on a happier speed to market situation. Can you provide a very broad perspective of the differences between the OASIS, PSS, and IT70 schedules? And do you recommend one over the other if they are leveraged in similar ways? So um, the IT70 and PSS schedules have been retired. They are both under mass. So you're really picking between mass and OASIS or mass OASIS and the GWAX program if you're looking at um, IT. The differences between the three is the main difference between schedules and other IDIQs within GSA is commercial versus non-commercial buying habits. So if you are used to cost plus or you work with agencies or are an agency that does cost plus, you're going to be looking at the GWAC program and OASIS. If you are looking for commercial, which is time and materials from fixed price, um, purchase card buys, that kind of world, you're going to be looking into schedules. Now you can use these commercial types under OASIS and GWAX. However, as much as you can, the schedules program is definitely more built for those kind of buys. It has that commercial spending, it includes only commercial items and follows all those rules of the FAR. Um, schedules also has streamlined buying habits in 8.4. There's BPA power, which GWAX and OASIS do not have. You can put a BPA against schedules. You can do a single award or a multiple award BPA, and they don't have caps like FAR 13 has for the BPA program. So it's a big thing that we have with schedules. Also with schedules, if you're doing it under the simplified acquisition threshold, technically you can look at three price lists because we do that fair and reasonable determination and go directly to a contractor as long as you've looked at three price lists. So we do also have that streamlined buying and that makes it a lot easier for agencies to get things done more quickly. However, if you need non-commercial, the main things we have, we have Oasis, GWAX, and actually another contract, BMO. Um, and we're gonna have Astro soon as well. So we really have four contracts. Oasis is R&D. So anything R&D is gonna be going through Oasis. That's those professional services in there. GWAX is gonna be anything IT large IT projects, these should be multi-million dollars, if not billion dollar projects. BMO is building maintenance and operations. This is related to non-commercial for construction services related to that situation um, and that building maintenance. What's that facilities look like? What do we need for a non-commercial buy of cost plus? And the last one is Astro. This is one that will be released sometime next year. And this is going to be our services contract related to drones. Again, this is going to be slowly related to um, non-commercial cost plus contracting. So it's going to determine what type of contract do you want? And then what type of buying habit do you want? And then what are you buying? So you've got those kind of buckets that you can go into. How do we authorize a non-schedule company to sell from our schedule? So you can add into your contractor a distributor um, you do have to put together a plan of how they are going to sell under your contract and how, um, and I think it's actually under the reseller clause, and then how they're going to report back to you and how you're going to report those sales. And then you are in charge of that quality control mechanism to make sure that they are getting the sales to you and that you are reporting them correctly. So. Um, you'll need to be able to provide all of that information if you are ever audited or if you receive a compliance review by an IOA or industrial operations analyst related to your compliance. Um, it is, it either works for people or it doesn't. So if you have a really strong distributor channel and you want to add these dealer resellers to your contract and you know that they're tied to your financial somehow or your um, financial system somehow, 
that would be a great start. If you kind of have people that are out in the wind and you're not sure, um, you're really going to want to make sure you get all of that information together before you even start. Can you address the GSA assist program? So the assist program is used for our um, assisted acquisition group. And the assist program is a task order management system that they use when they're doing the bids, um, RFQs, quote reviews, and task orders against um, when they're doing the contracting on behalf of another agency. And it's basically just their workload task order management system that they use. With the mass consolidation effort, understandably, the e-library has a mix of outdated and current data on vendor schedules, which makes analyzing industry partner pricing difficult. Does GSA plan to integrate e-library with current slash historical vendor scheduled data, for example, including labor categories, ODCs, descriptions, et cetera, to help vendors and agencies understand pricing in their markets more effectively? So an e-library is just the inventory tool. So really it's just listing the contractors that are under the contract. Um, we will be making some updates to e-library to give the current option year and then how much longer out of the 20 years a contractor does have on their contract. We will also be doing updates on the contracts as contractors complete all the um, documentation they need to, to start their implementation, to get them down to one contract. We will be start identifying which contracts are their go forward contracts for new works versus which contracts are only doing work that is existing and no longer accepting any new works. When it comes to Advantage, um, we are requesting all contractors update their price lists and get those price lists updated um, before March 31st, 2021. If your price list is not up to date by then and you've not updated it, it will be deleted out of Advantage. Um, and if it's deleted out of Advantage, you will lose your access to eBuy. So that's something that you need to be cautious of if you are industry. Um, eBuy only uses the special item numbers and the inventory tool. It doesn't actually show a price list. That being said, pricing tools such as Calc does show the price list in there. We are working with them to move them to the new SIN structure as well. Are you experiencing delays in evaluating proposals? We submitted our IT70 in early October 2020 and was noti notified as of November 16th, it was an evaluation. What is the typical timeline from this point? So typically it takes, um, we try and get all of the offers assigned to a CO uh, between 30 and 60 days. So that's the first step. The CO um, review can take anywhere between three months and a year. And that's gonna depend on how complex your contract is. It's gonna depend if you are doing something like a Haxon that needs an oral eval that has to go to another group to do a technical review. So it's all gonna depend on those kind of factors in there, but really it's anywhere between three months to a year. This is also why if it is your original offer, I always recommend go small and then modify to get in what you need. It's just an easier process and it makes it so that you can get on more quickly and you can update more quickly as well if you chunk it out. I provide remediation services, water, fire, mold re remediation services, as well as COVID-19 cleanup services. What schedule does remediation services fall under? Would it be 562910REM? Will COVID-19 have its own schedule? So COVID-19 will not have its own schedule. Um, we only will have the one mass contract. I don't need everyone having multiple contracts to have the same offering. Um, the remediation sin that you've listed is a great place to start. That's gonna be that core business of anything related to water, fire, mold, remediation. I would recommend, and I don't have the sin off the top of my head, but I would recommend looking through the facilities large category, that's gonna be one of the places where you're gonna see that cleanup service, sanitation, those kind of services and facilities. But I would definitely start in the remediation and go from there. Can product market research be drilled down to RFQ numbers that resulted in contracts? Um, 
because we don't put out how many um, yes and no. So you can look on FPDS and it will tell you how many bids came in um, really and got to the end, but it basically just shows you what was awarded. We don't really have a track of RFQs that had no award at all. It's very rare that an RFQ has no awards and is not put out soon thereafter. Typically, if an RFQ has no awards, it's because A, nobody bid on it, or B, um, there was a protest. Those are really the only two reasons, and typically it is put out again or expanded and put out again. So these are, uh, it's very rare to have an RFQ that does not result in uh, some sort of award. The awards would be an FPDS, which is also in beta.sam.gov. And you can use that when you're looking for your marketing things and you're looking through beta.sam of those awards. If you pull those reports and you see how many people put in submissions, if you start to notice that only two people or three people um, put in bids, these are great places that when that contract's up, when they do the next round, you're going to want to put in a bid. It means that there's a low amount of people that are putting in bids and it's a great chance that you could get into that market. Okay, so next. we have time for probably two more questions, Jen. Okay. Um, okay, so is the VPP being overlaid on top of GSA Advantage or is it a separate portal? Will GSA vendors be required to add all of their products to VPP as well? And what system, SIP, will be used to feed into VPP? So the VPP is separate and it is a system that manufacturers access um, a different way. Um, what our COs are doing is they are putting up the price lists that are being submitted in the price proposal template up against the VPP and the 4P tool to make sure that the pricing, the descriptions, the manufacturer part number, um, and that that contractor is an authorized reseller that's what they're going to be using that VPP for. It is not an advantage. If you do not come up as an authorized reseller, we will typically reach out to you and say, hey, you're not coming up on this. You may want to have your resell, your manufacturer add you to their list. And we'll just give you a heads up and the manufacturer can reach out and do that for you. What are the methods to pay IFF only pay.gov? So you'll pay your IFF. Um, it is through pay.gov, but we do it in the sales reporting portal. It just takes you there. You can pay by credit card as long as you're not over the limit of $24,999. You can pay by debit card, um, which has no limit. You can pay as much as you want on that one. And you can pay by ACH where you set up basically um, you set up uh, just like if you're paying your credit card and we will pull the money out. You can set up a, a bill pay. Um, that being said, it is processed like a check and it is not, it takes a little bit to show up um, on your portal to see that you've paid. So you may get a delinquency notice if you do do the uh, bill pay slash check payment. We do still accept them. We just kind of deter that situation. We would rather have you guys use one of the other things. You can also pay, if you're in TDR, you can pay monthly, uh, but you're only required to pay quarterly. And then for every, and then for quarterly reporters, you can only pay quarterly. But with that, since we only have two minutes left, um, I'm actually going to cut off. I am so sorry that we ran out of time for questions. If you guys would like to email us the questions at Mass PMO, we can do that. But Robin will also download all these questions for us uh, and we'll hopefully put something together that we can put out with the top questions. We do typically get kind of the same question over and over again. And we try not to answer it too many times, but what we can do is we will try and put it together so we can maybe put out an interact post just because I see there are about 57 questions left, which is, a, a bit higher than normal. So we will definitely do that. Um, just so you guys know, because I just saw this on here, there is not a CLP being issued for this, I believe, as it is industry focused. We usually only do CLPs if it is agency focused. But with that, thank you so much for coming. Thank you for awesome questions. Jen, thank you for reading the questions. And as always, Robin, thank you for being the best moderator out there. And I will turn it over to you. 
Uh, absolutely. And I just want to echo that. I think I love seeing all the questions come in and just sitting back and soaking up all the expertise. So I, I really appreciate the audience for being uh, really great with their questions and insightful. Uh, but that does it. Uh, I will email everyone some good information uh, here in a little bit once we wrap up. Uh, but with that being said, thank you again for taking time out of your day. Uh, feel free to email us if you have any questions and uh, stay safe, be kind to one another. That concludes today's webinar. Bye everyone.